freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode number 469 of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearmsauctions.com, where you set the price on guns, ammo, and accessories. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. Our theme today is the role of 2A grassroots advocacy, and our guest is Michael Fanson. Michael is the chief lobbyist for the Arizona Citizens Defense League and managing partner of, of APIC Policy Epic. Group. Epic. Epic Policy Group. Okay, Epic Policy Group. And handles government affairs for the Arizona Firearms Industry Trade Association. As FITA, the kid cools, the cool kids say, welcome back to the show, Michael and Fanson. How are you doing, my friends? We're doing okay. It sounds like we might need a little more coffee, though, to get through... <laughs> Reading yeah. you yep. in. Well, Cheryl, sometimes she puts in these scripts, she'll put initials and stuff in them, and she doesn't put dots between them or anything. <laughs> so I look at that, and it's capital letters, boom, epic. It's true. Because tricky. it's epic. It, it, because it is epic, and everything Michael does is epic. Well, Michael, we have so much we want to talk with you about. And full disclosure, we get to work together in the AZCDL. Uh, we are both on the board. You are a chief lobbyist. I am the vice president. And uh, we are doing our level best to protect the state of Arizona from all kinds of bad laws that steal our rights. And, um, you know, it's it's getting tougher and tougher. What would you what would you say about that? Because Arizona is a battleground state, especially, I think, maybe now, especially where gun rights are concerned. So talk to us about the current state of the Second Amendment in the state of Arizona. And I know you're about to make a distinction right there. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll lay off it for now. Um, <laughs> Carol knows me that it's all about Article 2, Section 26 of our state constitution, um, in addition to the, the our Bill of Rights. But uh, Arizona, and what a lot of firearms owners don't realize, is, yeah, we may have not had a lot of pro-Second Amendment legislation passed over the last couple of years, but just last session, we had... 34 anti-Second Amendment bills killed. So including, important. In, including repealing the Castle Doctrine, background checks on all firearm transfers, and that includes letting someone borrow your rifle to go hunting with. Um, civil penalty if you don't lock up your ammunition. Not just your firearms, but your ammunition. Um, there was a bill that was introduced banning the bump stock device even after the SCOTUS decision on allowing bump stocks. You know, So they were trying to circumvent Supreme Court decisions, um, red flag laws. There was one bill that was introduced that repealed the state's preemption law, which, you know, and we'll get into that a little bit later on, on why that's so important. But there were 34 anti-Second Amendment bills that were introduced in, in the House and, and the Senate. Luckily, majority of those in the House get assigned to judiciary and we have a uh, a super pro firearms uh legislator in kwong win um he's the chairman of judiciary so he immediately kills any anti-constitutional bills so it, it's you know we don't a lot of firearms owners don't realize what is, happens behind the scenes I, I mean we've already killed a bill for next session um last week uh, we got a phone call from uh, a DPS lobbyist letting us know that 
they were going to introduce a bill that expanded the CCW from five years to six years. Sounds great. An extra year, same cost, you know, things like that. But what they don't realize is the reciprocity laws and the federal legis- regulations on it, anything over five years, then every firearm purchase, it would have to be background checked and things like that. So your CCW is worthless when it comes to purchasing um, and no reciprocity because the compact between states is for five years, not six. Was that a sneaky? Yes. Maneuver? No, no, um, it, it really wasn't. They were just trying to, because of the backlog of CCW renewals, they um, were trying to make it a little bit easier without realizing. Eh, nah, <laughs> it's why we need people like you who understand these things. To make sure that, you know, even if it's well-meaning, even if it's not in any way trying to be sneaky, that, you know, we go, wait a minute, here's the reasons why this is not a good idea. We, so. Well, what's it, what's interesting to me is that we we don't have to have a concealed carry permit in Arizona. Correct. We're, we're treated like adults with that section. Correct. But what's interesting is that they're backlogged on permits Mm -hmm. that's an excellent point because we're not even required to and yet we are responsibly armed citizens who are seeking to go ahead michael i'm sorry to interrupt mike well having having a ccw gives you um i don't say added protections but added protections um when carrying you know you don't have to have a concealed weapons permit we have constitutional carry which was passed in 2010 thank you azcdl for for getting that passed but um and, and the grassroots effort behind it. But having that CCW, you know, when you want to go purchase another firearm, it, it, it accelerates because you've already done the, the enhanced background check. Um, you know, there are places that even with a constitutional carry, you can't carry your firearm, but with a CCW, you can. Now there's some other legal ramifications that if you violate a firearms law, you know, because you, you should know with a, with your CCW, it, it, it's, I, I always, when somebody asks me, should I get one? I always say yes. Yes. You know, I always tell folks to get one. You don't need it, yes. but it's better to have it. Yeah. We agree. We carry, we both have it. Absolutely. And, you know, it just makes you a more responsible gun owner too. I mean, there are some, uh, tr- when you first get the license, there's some training you go through. Mm-hmm. And so it helps keep you set up for that. Well, and I travel so much that the reciprocity really does come into play for me. And so um, that would have been a bad deal for me to lose that. Um, There is a federal bill that just recently was um, submitted by uh, Tennessee uh, Congressman Massey, Thomas Massey, for national constitutional carry. And so that's going to be an interesting thing to watch play out because it's super early on. It won't get passed in this session. It wouldn't get signed by our president anyway, our current president, but he's floating it right now and um, starting to gather signatures. So that'll be one to watch. Um, You mentioned, Michael, the word preemption. That is one of those words that we see come up in headlines or, you know, in bill on bills that, that come to the state house. I don't know that anybody really understands what that word means. Can you break it down for us a little bit? Yeah, it's really simple. Arizona has strong preemption laws. That prevents local jurisdictions, cities, towns, counties, from enacting stricter gun control measures than what the state has. Um, Preemption means that here's the state law. Mm -hmm. A local city cannot restrict more than what the state already does. Well, and there's something happening right now as Ah, we speak, if you're ready to maybe share that on here. We're sitting in the studio on September 24th, 2024, and um, just to kind of place us in time, but go ahead and talk about what uh, particular city in um, Arizona is doing that would preempt right? Is that the proper use of the word would preempt our state law? Go ahead. Can I just guess though something? Just guess. Oh, you guess. You're not going to guess, right? I I don't know anything about this, right? But I'm going to guess. Tucson. Nope. Usually. Whoa. 
Usually it's Tucson. This time it's somebody else. Yeah, it's on the other end of the state, Danny. Uh, okay. The the city of Sedona passed a city code saying that you cannot carry a firearm, a knife longer than three inches, or a weapon that could cause injury to a human, animal, or property in any city park, trail, or open area. Okay, my interpretation of that is, well, unless you have a CCW permit. So there's a benefit of having that. Um, you know, we were talking about, you know, going to Sedona and walking through one of their city parks, you know, with a firearm. Unfortunately, you know, we already have a CCW, so it doesn't apply to us. Mm -hmm. um, trying to get somebody to, to go there and walk through a city park and get arrested and then, you know, do that civil disobedience. Um, my interpretation of it is if I want to go fishing in Sedona, or some of the the through Oak Creek because that's mm -hmm. still part of, of Sedona. Mm -hmm. I can't carry my fishing knife with me. My fishing knife is longer than three inches. If I want to go hike the trails, which that's not going to happen, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I can't, if you were going to, <laughs> if I was going to, I can't carry a hiking stick with me. Right, because that could be used as a yes. you know, blunt edged tool, right? Yes. Of of self defense. So did yes. they pass this law? Yes. They did. Yes. Okay. So um, do we have to challenge it before it can go any further or what? We, I, I wrote a, uh, a brief yesterday and have a meeting with Representative Wynn tomorrow to discuss this further and the next steps and how AZCDL and the, le the legislature can work together to make sure that Sedona understands that they're in violation of state law. It's interesting because Sedona is the whole, all the places you described, that's the whole town of Sedona. Yes, it is. It, it, it's basically a, a park. Um, so that is uh, sad news that they think that they have the power to do that. Well, I, I find it, I don't want to say funny or ironic. I, I find it funny or ironic <laughs> that, you know, the city council, city council members really don't understand statute or law uh, majority of them don't so they have to rely on city attorneys or county attorneys to get the um, get the advice to be able to write these laws say hey i want to do this how can we frame it so it's legal under state statute um, the city of flagstaff with the banning on advertising on the gun range up there the gun shop up there at the airport they were told that hey it's legal the city of Phoenix was told that it's legal for them to transfer firearms to Ukraine, which the attorney general actually came out and said, no, it's not. Um, you know, the city of Tucson multiple times has tried to do preempt, preempt state statute, and we've had to take them to court multiple times. And uh, municipalities, the political subdivisions around our state need to hire better attorneys. Yes. Well, also the council members have no risk. They can do whatever they want because nothing happened to them, even if they do pass the ordinance. It's not like, what are you going to do? Put them in jail for passing an ordinance that's illegal? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, but you know, the last time I was in Sedona, and it's been probably six, seven months, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't see rampant crime. and No, absolutely you know. not. So help, help us understand this. So if you're a city and you're in Arizona, you can't preempt state law. You can't do anything more stringent than state law says. This, what this, is that relationship between the state and the federal? Because the federal says shall not be infringed in our Bill of Rights. We've been backed up with McDonald and Heller and now the Bruin case to define what that means, shall not be infringed. And yet, how many states... California, New York, Illinois. I mean, just go down the list. How many states are preempting the federal? Well, there is there's a difference between constitutional 
law, which okay. the Second Amendment falls under the constitutional law, and you have U.S. Code, just like we have our state constitution, which, you know, and, and I'll get into it, you know, you fed me that line already about, you know, the word impaired um, within Section 26 of, our, of, of Article 2 of our state constitution. Um, you know, we have a very, I want to say liberal gun laws, you know, in, in the definition of that term, it is. We have very open um, firearms or, or less than firearms restrictions. But the federal government has always determined and a lot of a lot of Supreme Court cases, I mean, going back to Marbury, you know, it's a state it's a state issue. You know, sending Roe v. Wade back to the states. It's a mm -hmm. state issue. Let the states decide, mm -hmm. um, which has happened. You know, so if California wants to say, you know, you can't have internal combustion engines and no firearms and, you know, you can't water your lawn, they can do that. Mm -hmm. Then how would that play out if, let's say, this administration or I'm going to say, God forbid, Kamala Harris Ooh. ends up, we are a nonpartisan show. Yeah, but sure if she yeah. wins the presidency, she has already promised us that she is going to institute, I think it's one of her day one things, a, an executive order to outlaw what she calls an assault weapon, an assault rifle, which is so not defined. I'm not even sure what that means, but but let's say that that plays out. And now at the federal level, she's going to say, and her administration is going to say, basically AR-15s or however they define them are going to be illegal. Why is that? Why is that something that the states have to adhere to if we have that separation? I guarantee the states are not going to adhere to it. Um, there'll be enough pushback. Or we have organizations um, that we partner with, that we collaborate with, such as the Second Amendment Foundation, Mm -hmm. um fpc um you know jpfo goa goa nra you know I, I mean there are state organizations state level organizations across the across the country virginia citizens defense league missouri citizens defense league arizona citizens defense league you have um uh, connecticut citizens defense league you know so i mean there are there are state level organizations that will fight back and we'll all sign on to, you know, a lawsuit against the federal government. And as you've seen mm -hmm. over the last 10 years, you know, we've won almost mm -hmm. every single, uh, we've won every single good case. Mm -hmm. There have been some not so good cases. Um, some cases that, that I personally don't think should have been brought up to the Supreme court and, Let's every town and Giffords and think think mm -hmm. they won something. They really right. didn't because it was a it was a bad case in the first place. Yeah. What scares me is they <clears throat> the federal government outlawed bump stocks and they got through that and so everybody had to destroy their stocks and then they find out that was unconstitutional. Yeah, but during the time during the it time, was yeah, so they were effective. Terrifying for a while, people. Yeah. Well, you know, and and bump stocks were done by an executive order. Mm -hmm. Oh. You know, and then. You know, I'm not going to play partisan or, or candidate wise, but, you know, do your research on it. Yeah. Well, and the ATF just being able to, you know, categorize yeah. things. Make and, rules. Yeah, make rules that act as laws that didn't actually go through the structure that laws go through. It's the the and the structure of those kinds of things are really something we have to start addressing mm with these organizations you just mentioned because um you know the from the top down yeah. they're happy with the more power we give them right <laughs> well one of the good things about um uh, fighting against fighting back against atf and um uh, the irs and and all the other um alphabet organizations that we have is the chevron decision was was overturned um, in this last Supreme Court session, which says that those agencies cannot make regulations that are law. Yes. You know, so I mean, that's 
to break it down as simple as possible. So this, the Chevron decision, do I agree with it? Yes, in part, mm -hmm. when it restricts our freedoms. Now, the EPA does certain regulations to protect our environment, protect our national parks, and things like that. And, and that, that's a good thing. You know, we want, as somebody who loves nature and loves the outdoors, and, and I, I was an avid hunter and, and fish and, and everything else, I want, I'm a Teddy Roosevelt kind of environmentalist. Um, I want our our country to stay green like it is and, you know, the trees and, and the national parks. So there has to be certain regulations. Mm -hmm. Less regulations, the better, but there has to be certain fences put up, mm -hmm. um, you know, for our ranchers and farmers and, and those who love the outdoors. But when you go overboard and saying, well, you know, we want to protect the environment and we can't cut down a tree because of a spotted owl. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have some kind of balance there. Yes. And, For sure. and that's where the Chevron decision being reversed kind of helped out a little bit. So, Michael, what's the difference between a law and a regulation? Uh, a law was passed by a legislative body and signed into law uh, by the executive of that whether it's a mayor, a governor, or, or the president. And a regulation is just put out as a rule by a department or um, regulatory agency. But can a regulation, I mean, I could go to jail because I don't pass a regular, because I disregard a regulation, right? Yes. But I, so what difference does it make? Um, regulations can be changed pretty easily. Laws usually cannot. Mm -hmm. especially on the federal level but but the thing is so what i guess what i'm getting at is the atf as an example is if they regulate something that it's just as powerful to them as a law at the time but you can get it it's very easily changed the congress can turn back around and say no that's not happening okay well, and the only way that, and this is going to take us to our next question the only way that congress really is going to make that change or turn it back around is if they hear from us, right? Mm -hmm. We have so much power. We, the people have so much power. If we will speak up, if we will use our voices. And so the grassroots movement for whatever your cause is, pick your cause for us. It happens to be a right to keep and bear arms is one of, you know, our main lanes that we stay in um but then even the word grassroots gets like polluted and and misused and it gets confusing because um these you know huge uh money people come in and start acting like you know oh we're grassroots yeah we paid all of our people to show up at this rally but we're grassroots so um can you help us just kind of define who the grassroots movement is and isn't um, just in the second amendment uh, conversation. Grassroots is actually, it, it's formed by the people uh, and that's the best way I can put it. There are a lot of grassroots organizations that have paid lobbyists and the lobbyist is usually the intermediary between grassroots grass tops in the legislature or the legislative process. Um, I am a lobbyist. I am a professional lobbyist. Um, it's what I do for a living. I actually started out in advocacy work as a grassroots supporter, grassroots advocate, just a citizen speaking out on, on issues. Um, realized I was really good at it. And here I am today, um, you know, 10 years later. But if, if you're passionate, it doesn't matter what issue it is, but second, the Second Amendment being, uh, or firearms being one that your listeners are, are passionate about. But you can be passionate about, you know, no-kill dog shelters. Um, I, I know somebody who is extremely passionate about no-kill dog shelters. And they do rescues all the time. And, and that's what she puts her effort into. And she does it grassroots. She does 
asked her neighbors to donate money so she can have a rescue. And, you know, that's a grassroots effort. Um, AZCDL started out with four guys um, around around a lunch table at Five and Diner in Casa Grant or, or you know, somewhere down there. And we're 25,000 strong now. But it's it's a it was started out grassroots. Um, yes, I am the paid lobbyist uh, for AZCDL, but it's a grassroots organization. It is a all volunteer all organization that you know, people should support. If you have own a firearm, you should support it. Um, we're mm-hmm. fighting to to protect your freedoms. And that's the sad thing is that Mar- it just in Maricopa County alone, we have so many gun owners that are not, they're not voting, they're not contributing to groups like AZCDL. And it's really a shame because it just takes a few dollars. Absolutely. So AZCDL.org, if you're listening right now, you don't even have to be an Arizona citizen to support the work that we do. And why would you want to do that? Because what happens in one state is clearly bleeding over into so many other states. So I would encourage everybody listening, check out azcdl.org. But something Dan just said, um, we've been talking about this number here, uh, specifically in Arizona. We're we're calling it 133,000 gun owners who are not even registered to vote. Well, I would say those are some rookie numbers, right? Because how many people are gun owners that rightfully, bless you, Dan, rightfully, the government shouldn't even know who you are. Bless you again. Um, And so I believe that there are probably vastly more than 133 gun owners out there um, who are not voting. We live in a state of, is it something like 7 million here in Arizona, Michael? Yes. And so you know, if you're one of the 133 that, that we think we know about, 1, 133, sorry, 133,000 that we think we know about, why aren't you registered to vote? Why aren't you showing up at the polls, having your voice heard? Why are you giving that? If you want to use like a sports analogy, that's 133,000 yard advantage that you're allowing people who don't support your values, who would take your gun away in a heartbeat if they could get the government to do it. You know, what, what do you say about that, Michael? You know, it's, it's voteamerica.org is the one who did that, uh, put out those numbers. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we're just carrying on with the, with the research that they did. Um, vote they came... for america.org. I think it is. Yes. Vote for america.org. Um, you know, they came back and said they they did a lot of background research. They did a lot of polling. They did a lot of big money research to get this number. The the polling number out there is about 45 percent, 48 percent of Arizona citizens own a firearm. So if we have seven million people in our state, we have three and a half million firearm owners in our state, roughly. You know, we'll we'll kind of round up on it um that's a lot of voters mm-hmm. okay 133,000 is is a drop in the bucket when it comes to that but people don't realize and they need to that most legislative races are usually determined by a couple hundred votes or less and that's important the 133,000 can swing a district to pro-freedom or anti-freedom Mm-hmm. You know, raise your taxes or not raise your taxes. Um, it's those little things. And there were a congressional primary um, in uh, CD8 this, or CD7, you know, taking over uh, Ruben Gallego's seat. Okay. Uh, uh, and sorry, uh, Yasmin and sorry won her race against Raquel Turan with 40 something votes, wow. like 40 something votes, sending her to be our, our congressional representative. That That is a dark blue district that 
she's got that district for as long as she wants it by 40 mm -hmm. something votes. Wow. Well, we even have a legislative districts here in Arizona that don't even have a single Republican or independent or libertarian running. Well, there, there I, are some there are some dark Republican districts that they don't have Democrats running. And I would think, why would you seed that? Why would you seed that ground? And I don't, you know, I'm not a politico. I don't really understand, you know, some of their strategy that goes on behind the scenes. But my daughter was in one of those districts um, before she moved. And she w just stood with her mouth open, looking at her ballot, going, wait a minute. I, I don't even have anybody that I can vote for. I feel disenfranchised why am I being left out in the cold and how many more people like me would, would have, you know, voted for a, a Republican. So if it's a deep red or if it's a deep blue, it's going to stay that if you don't even give somebody an option well, to compete. I, I, I agree. And I, I live in one of those districts. I live in a very dark blue district with no Republicans running for the house or the Senate. Um, you know, so if the, if the Democrat, the Democrats who won the primary are who's going to be elected in November, um, which if the district wants that, that's fine. I'm OK with that. That's part of our, our Democratic Republic that we have. But there needs to be somebody to challenge there. Yes. The, this, I, I, I spoke with a my former senator who is running for city council uh, about this type of thing, that we need to have that civil discourse on public policy. Yes, that do. debate is a good thing. Yes, you know, is. and I say it over and over again, if we can have cordial debate about policy, not about personality, but about policy, mm -hmm. we can actually find solutions to issues that are going on. You know, the, the Democrats and the Republicans on both sides of the aisle last year debated and had, had a cordial debate about our housing issues. Yes. And they actually came up with solutions. It was it, it was wonderful to see. They've done it on on homelessness in the past. They've done it on veterans issues in the past. It is the hot button topics, abortion, firearms, school choice, those type of things that are people get very emotional about mm -hmm. and yeah. once you get emotional you lose you lose the argument completely and people don't like losing and you know they start calling people names and you, know, you get wrapped up in that and so why would i why would i put myself through something like that if i'm just going to be called names i can i can see that but I do think that that is something that maybe the grassroots need to start insisting on in whatever ways they can mm -hmm. give us somebody that has our voice in our district, even, you know, and, and maybe it's the person who's listening to this right now today that says, you know what, that's it. I'm going to run. I know I'm going to get beat up. I know I may not win, but I'm going to run. If, if there's one of your listeners that says, Hey, I want to make a difference. I want to throw my hat in the ring and run for school board or city council or run for Congress. Okay. At the end of, at the end of this broadcast, I'll give you my contact information. You can contact me and I'll direct you either myself or one of my staff or an organization that we're, we're partnered up with. will help you in two years. We're going to need it in two years. Yep. You know, people don't realize that, and you got to start now to oh, be yes. ready for two years from now. Absolutely. And that's a mistake that I think the libertarians make a lot. They don't do the work they need to do in the off season. And then all of a sudden it's game time. And they're like, wait a minute, how come we can't get on stage? How come we're not getting, you know, representation and, and a voice? You've got to work in the off season. So you're ready for the, the playoffs. Is that a yeah. good sports analogy? <laughs> that's a good that's a good sports analogy. Okay. You know, there, there are there are a few libertarians on the ballot across the state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a few libertarians that are running for school board and city councils, which are not quote unquote nonpartisan races, uh, which is great. You know, um, I'm very libertarian leaning in, in a lot of my policies. 
Um, I'm, you know, a, a classical liberal in in political terms. Um, going back to John Locke and Thomas Jefferson and, and, and that aspect of, of what government or limited government should be, smaller government should be. So, you know, there's, we need to have a say so. We do. We and should do what? Just since January of 2023, 461 bills were introduced in Congress anti Second Amendment. Wow. wow. Okay. Crazy. Anti constitutional, then. Yes. I mean, yeah. 461 in a year and nine months. And if we, the people, aren't speaking up, aren't running for these offices, aren't showing up to have our voices heard, then why not? What does a constitution matter if somebody's not there to defend it? And that was the only promise our founders made us, right? Well, you, that yeah. it would take eternal vigilance to maintain what they put in place for us. You know, James Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers, um, I think it was number 46, um, he discussed the advantage of being armed, contrasting the American people with those other nations whose governments were afraid to trust the people with guns, but with arms. You know, our government, if they would trust us with firearms, you know, this is the this is that belief that an armed population could de deter government overreach and government tyranny. That was the whole reason for the Second Amendment. It wasn't about defending yourself. It wasn't about going hunting. You know, the Second Amendment is not about duck hunting. You know, I have the bumper sticker somewhere. Um, it is about a deterrent to governmental tyranny. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, but and, if we don't well, protect you, ourselves, we can't protect, you know, yeah, our I mean, larger yeah. selves. So yeah. it makes, it falls in line and it makes sense. Yeah, so. President, President Biden said, well, <clears throat> the Second Amendment's about, you know, fighting back against the government. You're going to need tanks and, you know, armed rockets and, and um, F-18s and things like that. I'm like, yes. Right. I can drive a tank. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, Mike, I want to, I'd like to get back with the, our state. Uh, our, what's the state of our state right now? I mean, you go to the Capitol a lot. You see what's going on. We have voting coming up in November. Uh, are we, should we be afraid? Um. <laughs> the, you know it, it's uh my wife said to me once uh, and asked me are you afraid of anything and so i'm usually not i said yeah you notice we don't have a ladder in the house i'm afraid of heights <laughs> there you go okay um am i concerned yeah. absolutely yeah. am i afraid no um, I've seen, I've seen stuff that would, that would make you throw up, um, on, on things around the world that I've seen when, from my time in the Marine Corps, I've seen governmental tyranny on what it does to a people. I've seen, you know, dictatorships and, and what they do to a populace. We live in the best country in the world. Is our individuals trying to take and pick apart our freedoms piece by piece? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I truly want to believe that both sides of the aisle want what's best for the country. How that looks is completely different. Just because somebody disagrees with me doesn't mean they're a communist or evil or anything like that. It means they disagree with me. And if I can sit down with them and explain my position and my policy view on something and hear theirs, maybe we can find a compromise without losing freedom or our constitutional rights and doing what's best for the country. I think that's very well said. Um, but I think it's also important to be able to understand that there are ideologies and values that lean towards Marxism, for example, right? And if we can't identify those things, then they they sometimes are like ear candy. They, they kind of sound good. But if we don't understand either 
the person who's conveying them where they're already trying to pull us or where these kinds of policies could end up leading very easily. I think that's how we end up so off track in, in certain times. So where you don't have to call somebody a communist or a Marxist necessarily, you can understand that their values and their, their, their speeches and their um, ideologies very much can lean in those directions. Do you disagree? No, I, I agree with you completely. Um, you know, I'm asked a lot, you know, what do I think the difference between a Republican and a Democrat is? It's really simple. The Republicans believe on, on, on the bottom line, the Republicans believe that an individual can make decisions for themselves and what's best for them and their family going forward for their freedoms. The Democrats believe it's the government's responsibility to make the decisions for you. Mm-hmm. That is true. Yeah. yeah. If, 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 if an individual is not educated on how things work, on the the background of what Marxism is, mm-hmm. you know what communism is, what you know the the left's ideology versus the right's ideology. If you don't understand that and learn on well how a bill becomes a law in the state yeah. of Arizona versus Congress, I mean people tell me all the time, well. You need to call our congressman because the city over there did this. They have nothing to do with that. You know, it's all this. You know, one of the the things that I love about Women for Gun Rights is is the annual um, tour of the Capitol uh, Mm -hmm. that we get to do. You know, so, I mean, it's please make sure that your listeners know that. And the larger the group, the better. And we can get more people educated and, you know, the meetings that we have and things like that. So whatever whatever we can do to educate the populace, you know, through uh, gun freedom radio, through other podcasts, through books, you know, whatever we could do, we can, you know, the more educated you are, the more educated voters you are, the more freedom we'll have. The thing that puzzles me, you know, I don't want to use the word afraid either. Mm-hmm. Right? I think that's kind of over overstating, but I am also concerned because Every day I see that there are people that are, are so, so-called so leaders mm-hmm. that are trying to take our rights away. The Constitution is very clear, very easy, very easy to understand, and they're chipping away and taking our rights away from us. I mean, if you look back the last 50 years, how many things have we compromised with mm-hmm. and lost? Mm-hmm. And I, I'm just I'm just really concerned about that. And our... our our Congress in in Arizona is starting to become weaker and weaker as far as gun rights go. So I am concerned. Well, and I think that takes me to my next question. And we are starting to get a little tight on time. So this may be our, our last topic today. But what do the voters, let's just take the state of Arizona, because that's where we live. That's where most of our efforts um, are are employed. What do the voters in the state of Arizona need to know about this election when in, I I think we're down to just over 30 days before we're going to be voting on state and federal and city uh, issues. What do we need to know, Michael? Well, our governor and attorney general uh, will be in office and secretary of state will be in office for two more years. Okay. Um, People will start popping up and running for office in 2026 for those positions. Great, get behind them now. You know, find out your find your candidate. Get behind them now. Um, legislative races are every two years. You know, so this election cycle, 2026, 2028. It's the importance of electing, and I'm going to use the term pro Second Amendment, but pro firearm friendly mm-hmm. and or firearm supportive because mm-hmm. there's a difference between firearm friendly and firearm supportive mm-hmm. okay and i use it all the time we have we have a lot of legislators that are firearm friendly mm-hmm. but they're not firearm supportive they won't stand and and dig their boot heels in and say well you know what this issue is i'm not going to compromise on 
and what Danny's concerned about. But they'll, but we have also others, and, and I'm a constitutionalist when it comes to that. You know, First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth, Fifth, all the way to the Fourteenth, and what it says in our Constitution, we need to abide by. You know, our first. I read an article um, out of a, a law journal, uh, a law review this past week about is hate speech protected under the First Amendment? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I may it's hate the, the hate. reason it's there because I, yeah, it's unpopular. I, it's awful. Yeah, right. I may, I may hate the hate speech. Right. But I'm going to uh, you have a right to do it. And I will defend that. Um, and I always give the example. Westboro Baptist Church back when they were protesting veterans funerals or you know the, our, our military funerals I, I joined the Patriot Guard Riders to as a buffer between those idiots and mm -hmm. the, the military members family mm -hmm. to give them some protection but I also defended their right to say whatever they wanted to say exactly. so you know it, it's that type of thing we have the Second Amendment to protect from the stop the government from taking those freedoms away. And we need to remember what our freedoms are. Um, you know, the freedom of religion is not separation of church and state because that's just a, an idea. It is you can worship whatever you want. You can worship a toaster if you want as your God. That's what our First Amendment says. You know, freedom of assembly, you know, freedom to redress of grievances. We need to exercise those rights. If you don't exercise a muscle, they become weak. Mm -hmm. We need to exercise our rights. Exercise your Second Amendment. You know, go out to the gun range. Um, Fridays at Shooters World in Phoenix and, and Chandler, you know, or Ladies Day. Ladies, go out and shoot. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, seriously, exercise Invite your right to vote. Yes. Um, exercise your right to vote. Exercise your right to um I have a book. I haven't started reading it yet, but a guy walked through um, the, the the Bill of Rights and exercised all his constitutionally protected freedoms within the Bill of Rights. He actually went out and for a third amendment is no court. We can't quarter military um, in, in houses. He went out and found a military member and brought them in his house with no rent for a couple days or a week or something like that. So he can exercise his third amendment, his third amendment rights. So it, it's kind of funny how we can take that to the extreme, but we need to realize and be educated on what those are. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's, that's uh, very well said. There there's congressional races. Um, we know that uh, Congressman Stanton uh, has always been very anti second amendment um kelly cooper is running against him and this is not an endorsement but i've known kelly for a long time um mm -hmm. he's a he's a marine um and i know her, i know him from my marine circles um you know i i i'm supporting his campaigns on a personal level but it's you know um there's down ticket races county sheriffs state legislators judges you mm -hmm. know retaining judges and and um you know, school board members, you know, school board members are often overlooked. It's a nonpartisan race. They don't get paid for the job. But if you have a friendly school board, mm -hmm. we can get faster saved lives into that school system or a school district. Exactly. You know, so there's elections have consequences. Mm -hmm. Either they're going to be good consequences or bad. ones. It's it's your choice. Absolutely. I think that's very well said, and uh, it really kind of boils down to make sure you register to vote and actually don't just vote, okay? I, I, I think I always skip a step when I say this. Get registered to vote. Get informed. Know what you're voting for and vote for your values. So that that I think is a step that we skip too often when we're telling mm -hmm. people, just get registered to vote and vote, right? Well, yep. vote for who? AZCD. A AZCDL on their uh, on the webpage AZCDL.org um, has a vote tracker and I put it together put it together every year uh, for how our legislators vote uh, so you can actually go look in the last two years if somebody's running for re-election 
you can see how they voted on all firearm related bills. Absolutely. And Michael, we are running out of time, but I just okay. want to know, um, how can people follow you? Where do you live so they can follow you around? Um, <laughs> I live in Glendale. Uh, so um, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Um I'm on social media. Usually just my name, epicpolicygroup.org uh, is a website, but um, I have a blog as well. Um, in fanzin.blogspot.com. Uh, so great stuff. Well, thank you for all you do. And um, we will, yeah. we also have a, a big annual meeting coming up uh, that people can find out about at azcdl.org under our events tab. And um, we're forming a pack. So this time next year, for sure, we will have some uh, better information about who we think would truly support the work that we do uh, so that people can make more informed votes. So we've got a lot going on azcdl.org for sure. Pay attention to that. And, one. The, and the foundation as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Michael. We will Thanks, talk folks. to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We'll see you. Michael in Fanson. He's a, a great guy. Great guy. Yeah. And such a good mentor to me as I was coming into doing work down at the Arizona State Capitol and the tour that he mentioned. Um, so Women for Gun Rights, I am the Arizona State Director for Women for Gun Rights. And once a year, we do gather a group of our members together. And Michael uh, got a set up last year that we got to speak with our legislators. We got to do some mock, um, mock um, testifying, right? Uh, down at the state, uh, we got to see the museum. And so if you're interested in that, be sure you're a member. Go to womenforgunrights.org. And when you sign up, your zip code will tell the system that you're an Arizona person and you will uh, land in my email and I will reach out to you and we'll get you all signed up. It's free membership. Um, AZCDL is a paid membership. But your dollars, uh, what is it, like $40 a year for an individual? We do a lot of work yes. with your $40. So anyway, I, I think I interrupted you. Nope, Go ahead. That was it. That was Fantastic. It. Well, we need to start wrapping up. Uh, thank you so much again to Michael and Fanson. Um, thank you to all of our viewers and listeners all across the nation. Wherever there is internet, we have viewers and listeners. Your time is your most finite resource. And when you spend it with us, we don't hate that. Uh, if you want to listen to the audio only version of this show, you can go to our website, gunfreedomradio.com, click the on demand tab and binge listen to your hot content. Um, and if you want to see links and photos and bios of all of our guests and including Michael and Fanson, go to the guest tab. There is a huge body of um, subject matter experts there ever growing and uh, we, we value your time and attention on there. If you want to watch this uh, episode again, video style, you can go to YouTube, GunStreamer, the Opsland smartphone app. And when you get to those platforms, it is vital to the, um, really the longevity of the work we do and the ability for us to continue to bring subject matter experts for you to, and it costs you nothing, right? Hit the like button. It tells that platform you like this content. Hit the uh, share button. It tells this platform, right? The YouTube platform that your friends are also going to like this content. Hit the subscribe button. What does that do? That tells them, hey, this is so valuable to me. I don't want to miss a single episode. And you hit the notifications, which tells those platforms you want to be the first person to click in and listen and start giving them, right, eyes on their platform. So those things are very important. Please do those uh, when you, you know, find our, our shows. And we have 400, what I say? This is 469. So we got lots for you to listen to and watch. Um, I want to say something about some good friends of ours. We have some great friends who have produced a product called LockedInGrip.com. And this is a product made for shooters by shooters. It is a liquid shooting sports chalk for safer, faster shooting. Why? Because 
you will not lose a good solid grip on your firearm. Go to lockedingrit.com, get yours today. And if you ever, God forbid, have to engage in a self-defense um, incident where you've used uh, not only your firearm, but a you know a tool of any kind to defend yourself, you are immediately going to need a lawyer. So if you go to our homepage, gunfreedomradio.com, scroll down, you will see a link there for attorneys on retainer. We are clients of theirs. Thankfully, we've never needed their service, but we rest easy at night knowing that we have an attorney on retainer. And if you click through our site, we get a little tiny bit of um, every membership that is joined there. And we love America. We love supporting American jobs on American soil, buying American-made products. And you can too if you go to patriothousehold.com forward slash GFR, a tiny portion of every dollar you spend there on your household products that you're going to buy anyway, your shampoo, your laundry soap, um, all the things you use around your house, tiny portion of every dollar you spend comes to the work we do and the Second Amendment Foundation, patriothousehold.com forward slash GFR. All right, Dan, until next time, what are we going to do? We're going to pray for our leaders. And our nation. We're right? going to pray that people get up and vote. Yes, absolutely. Please get involved and vote. And the leaders that are already in place, the representatives that are already in place, the ones that we don't particularly like too much because we feel like they're serving themselves maybe or values that don't represent us, we're going to pray for them even especially more so. Well, if we'd vote <clears throat> and the people that are Second Amendment supporters would vote, we wouldn't have to worry about those leaders. It's true. We'd have a lot fewer of them. I mean, nobody's perfect, but you, I agree with you. All right. Until next time, be good to each other. Have a great week and God bless. Bye-bye.